we come now to the moment uh, when our relationship with the Bushmen in the central Kalahari Desert was really full and complete. We had been living with them for many weeks. We had shared a great many experiences with them. We'd been hunting with them, we'd been hungry with them, we'd been thirsty with them. And now we had danced with them. And we had shared perhaps one of the greatest experiences of all, the coming of the rains in the central desert. Now, this question of rain may sound very dreary to people in Europe and America. But I can assure you there's nothing more wonderful than to see the rains breaking in a place like the Kalahari Desert. There it's a matter of life and death. And the Bushmen, who are so very much children of nature, who are so close to it and so much part of it, they feel the, the question of the rain so much that when it doesn't rain, the women go sterile and bear no children. So when these rains broke, that night after a great dance, the reaction was wonderful. The reaction of the earth, the plants, the animals, and the bushmen was in a sense a reaction to a miracle. And we noticed all sorts of changes in the bushmen. One of the first things I noticed, and a thing I shall forever associate in my mind with the coming of the rains in that central desert, is a new song which they suddenly started singing around about us. I would just like to play that song for you because it is very moving and fits the occasion so beautifully. The earth cried under the sun, I'm dry. My heart cried by the fire, I'm alone. The wind came and said, the rain is coming. The grass said, a hunter is near. Yes, truly, the rain is near. Oh, listen, a hunter is here. It rained for two days, and I sat in my camp, this tune constantly going through my head. When at last the sun broke through the clouds, it shone on a world transformed. It was astonishing how the stricken desert burst into life. The branches of the thorn trees seemed lit with bright buds overnight. The desert may flashed like snow against a blue sky. Wild begonias, sweet honeysuckle, pink, purple and yellow convolvulus bloomed all around us. More and more May came out. Petunia, desert cried. The stainless amaryllis of classical Greek purity shone underneath silver nets of the awakened cocoons. The wild protolaria, the flowering thistle, the delicately carved bohinia suddenly shone like stars in the grass and against the blood-red sand. The honey bees, brought to life, crowded around our camp and raided our water bags. Beetles we'd not seen before came out to burrow. Centipedes started traveling and exploring. The chameleon who is loathed by all bushmen because they say he brought the first news of death from the moon to the world, found it paid once more to emerge and fish for insects in the sun. The tortoises began to hatch their young and the birds to sing in a way they'd not sung before. And the birds started rebuilding their nests. 
We had several great nests of the fabulous community birds near the sip wells. Their noise night and morning was deafening. A hawk hung overhead all day long trying to catch them coming in and out of their common nest. But they were always too much on the alert and knew when the hawk was furthest away. They'd emerge all together then like waves of smoke. The great process of renewal was evident everywhere. The larger animals began to bear their young. In a deep hole nearby, we watched a baby hyena, one of the shyest twilight animals in the world, getting bigger. We helped it along with morsels of our own food. And close by, the cub of a fox one day flashed by one of our cameras. Then most pathetic of all, in a patch of scarlet lilies one morning, we found a baby springbuck. It was bleating like a child for its mother, because the mother appeared to have been killed by a lion. So Mu told us, after examining the spur, Mu said it was a lion which prowled nightly round the sip wells. Every morning in the distance, we'd see the ostriches doing their mating dance. Soon our hunters, Mu, 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 and Bao Tno, were coming back with ostrich eggs in their satchels. They told us that everywhere the birds had begun to lay. And then one day, Dabe and I, out hunting, too, saw a glint of white in the distance. And we knew at once what it was. One of the curious things about the ostrich is that she lays her eggs always in an open space. She does that because she wants to make quite certain that there's nothing creeping up behind her to destroy her. The ostrich can protect herself very easily against hyena, jackal, and less, the lesser carnivorous animals. But she cannot do that against the lion and the leopard, although she has a tremendous kick in that long stringy leg of hers. Those talons of the ostrich are extremely dangerous. Now, as we walked towards this nest, Dabe and I noticed a very curious thing about it. We saw something that has always intrigued me about ostrich egg nests. There was one egg lying well outside the nest. Well, Muren, Dabe said, you must know the reason then. This bird is so weak in the head that it needs the egg outside the nest to remind it of what it's doing when it's sitting on the other eggs to hatch them. If that egg weren't outside, the bird's head is so weak it would forget why it's sitting there and it would just get up and walk away. Daily, uh, this sort of spring fever that was about in the plants and the animals seemed to invade our bushmen, to go deeper and deeper into them. A kind of restlessness came all over them. Our hunters would go out in the morning and sometimes stay away for a day or two even, things they'd never done before. And I began to realize that they were really spying out the land. Spying out the land to see if the moment hadn't come when they could set out again on one of their great walkabouts. The thing that they really live for and love above everything else. And the change seemed to me greatest of all in Ngu and Kukam, lips of finest fat. I would pass them and I would hear them humming this new tune which I heard with the breaking of the rain. And they would be looking at each other in a way which I hadn't quite noticed before, although I'd had my suspicions. And I said to Dabe one day, I said, Dabe, now, if a bushman falls in love, how can you tell that he is really in love? And he sort of scratched his old bushman head and he said, Moren, you know, he said, they start doing things they've never done before. I said, what sort of things, Dabe? He said, well, Moren, they begin to notice things you've not seen them noticing before. Darby's words came back to me when I saw the women prepare the ground one day around their shelters for one of their favorite games. For this game, they use a tsama, melon, as a ball. They throw it to one another on the run in a sort of game of rounders, singing as they do so, we went out into the desert to look for melons. 
and on the way what do you think we saw? We saw a blue wildebeest, but the blue wildebeest just flicked his heels at us and ran away. We went deeper into the desert, and what did we see? We saw a hartebeest and called out, Oh, hartebeest, come to us. But it just flicked its heels and ran away. Then we saw a hemsbuck, and we cried, Oh, hemsbuck, come to us, because we're hungry. But it just flicked its heels and ran away. When the game got to this point, I suddenly saw what Dabe meant about Bushmen in love. Because there was Mu at the unmanly pastime of watching the women play. And we all thought we knew whom he was watching. There was another sure sign that something was up. Dabe said, you see in the morning when the sun is not yet high, such a man will call on the women when they're getting up and even light their fire for them. <laughs> Dabe said, and if the woman gives him her water shell to drink from, you can be fairly certain there is something between them, as certain as this old lady appeared to be. And what is stranger still, Dabe said, is that such a man will begin to notice things he's never noticed before. He'll even stop on his way to look at flowers. I must confess, too, that when Mu came into camp to play for us and to listen to our recordings of Bushman music, he seemed to me now preoccupied in a way in which he had never been before. Then Duncan came back one morning and said he just had a lovely windswept glimpse of Ku Tam, our beauty. He said he'd seen her very pensive and without headdress, staring at the flowering amaryllis near the sip wells. Not long after filming in the Bushman camp with Duncan and Dabe, I saw something that made me think. 
Mu suddenly appeared at the shelter of Tu Tam. He had a satchel full of something, and he looked very mysterious in the process. When he suddenly went and sat beside Tuk Tam to pour out a heap of one of the greatest Bushman delicacies, the rare Marama nut, Dabe whistled, Moren, master, he's been at it for days. When Tuk Tam broke one nut in half and gave the first nut to Mu, Dabe turned to me and said, Moren, now the fat's in the fire. When I saw Mu some days later, cleaning a Hemsbuck head, my last doubts vanished. The next thing Dabe said to me is, Moren, such a fellow will be making a bow next. Now here we come to one of the most interesting things about the life of the Bushman. I've heard all my life of the existence of a Cupid's bow, of course, as you have. But I've never seen it as a living part of a living society. Now, the Bushman actually uses a love bow in his courtship. When a Bushman falls in love, he takes the horn of a buck, which you've just seen, he makes a little bow out of it, a little bow like this, which is a bow that Nu made for me, and he makes a little quiver and fills it with tiny little arrows. And then when he's ready, he takes an arrow, fits it to his bow, rather like this, and then he stalks his lady love, and his proposal consists of aiming this little bow at his lady love and shooting it into her, like that. Now, I want to emphasize one thing about this to you, and that is that the Bushman ve feels very deeply about this love bow business. It's part of his religion, and in getting Mu and Kok Tam our beauty, to act out the love bow ritual sequence for us. They did so very reluctantly. It was a great act of trust on their part. And any restraint in their movements and actions is due entirely to that. Our first intimation that the bow was ready was when Mu drew me aside one morning and asked if I would meet him alone in the desert. We heard him coming a long way off. He was playing his string instrument as he came towards us, in a glade bursting into flower. And there, for the first time, I saw the Bushman's Cupid's bow. As for the woman, Dabe said, Moran, she'll be sitting by herself and singing and singing to herself. And she'll be forced almost to help to go out and look for the food. The man, meanwhile, Dabe said, will make certain no one will know what he's been doing and where. That done, he'll make for a place where he knows his woman is going to be. You see the woman coming, and unseen will creep close to her.
Then he'll shoot his arrow at her. If he hits her, Dabe continued. And provided she doesn't throw the arrow away, then you'll see a thing or two. We then saw Mu in the distance, walking to a spot where lips of fat, returning, couldn't fail to see him. Wait, Moren, Dabe said. You'll now see how his food has been prepared for him. The arrow was unbroken. Moren, Dabe said, she is his. We saw Mu suddenly respond in the way Bushmen for thousands of years have responded in this situation. His arms went up and, like an eagle, he went after her. A fortnight later, this drama came to the end of its beginning. Mu had the blanket of buckskin ready as the final ritual demanded and draped it round her before us all one morning. As Dabe had put it, from then on, she was his. My own little drama, this 40-year-old drama of mine, too, was coming to an end. Daily I noticed our bushmen were getting more and more restless. I realized that it would be cruel to hold them back much longer from their longed-for walkabout into the great desert. They looked at me in so sort of way as if to say, aren't you coming along as well? Of course, and alas, I couldn't do it. So I told, I told my people, pack up, get ready, because we too must move on. The children watched the last preparation with the look one sees in the eyes of the inarticulate when their home is breaking up for a journey. To distract them, I made Dolce, scent of gazelle, and her brothers help me pack. On the final morning, at grey daybreak, the older ones were in our camp. The fire and their eyes followed us from one end of the disin... They shivered by the grating camp to the other. Charles, Johnny and I felt miserable to pull down what had been our home for so long in the desert. I thought at times I saw a look of reproach. On some of those wrinkled old bushman faces. They didn't seem to understand, really, why it was at all necessary for us to go when we'd all been such good friends. Music. Mu and his bride seemed forced to console themselves, as always in the past, with some of their beloved... I left first. I think I left first because I felt rather upset. I was about to step into my car when I saw Dalte, as I'd seen her in the beginning. Saw her again in a sort of child mother role, running up to make certain I had water enough for the journey. My last view of them all was of them standing by the side of the track we'd made to the sip wells. And from there on, the track went out over the dunes and on beyond to the great world from which we'd come and the world which knew them not. Duncan, who stayed to film the end, said that Mu and his bride stood there, staring after us, until my car vanished from sight. All that day, I was oppressed by one thought. In those last days of the sip wells, I wanted to give the Bushmen a present, and I found it almost impossible to give them one. I realized that I had nothing to give, which in some way wouldn't add to the litter of their little lives and make life more difficult for them. And I realized now on the way out, there was only one way which was really giving to the Bushmen at all. And that was the way of giving them a place in our hearts 
and imaginations and consequently a place in our planning for the future. And that is so urgent and so necessary because this process of elimination I've been describing to you, this 40,000 year old process of elimination is still going on in the Kalahari Desert. Make no mistake about that. We've stolen all the Bushmen's best water, the black man the, and the yellow man and the white man. And the Bushman is still threatened. And what is more, is administered by people who do not really care and who do not understand. Do you know that in the whole of the administration which administers that great desert territory in your name and mine, there's not one man who speaks Bushman. There's not one man who really knows what they think and what they feel. Do you realize that the game in the Kalahari Desert is protected and the Bushman is punished? punished for hunting and killing the game, although he needs it for survival. And he who owned all that country, who was the lord of it all once, he has no such protection at all. He has no special rights of any kind. And this thought darkened my whole morning on that way out from the sip wells. On the way back, along the fringes of the desert, I saw signs of how this process of elimination by disintegration among the Bushmen was going on. I kept on coming across fragments of what had also once been happy Bushmen communities, like the one I had just left behind. Gone now, and gone were the frank, unashamed, with a self-reliant, sturdy, manly people like Mu, Pao Pao, and Mu Mu. And gone were the frank, unashamed women like Mu Kam, and Gautze and her friends, I saw instead sordid, demoralized people in the grip of a disdainful rag and tatter contamination with our own civilization. I saw them doing work for a people who didn't understand them and didn't know their beginnings. I saw them as convicts in convicts' clothes, punished for laws they didn't make in a language they couldn't understand. I found one oasis even, with a jail to compel the Bushmen to live in a way which was not only not their own, but also a kind of death to them. I saw the deadly marks of our own incomprehension and lack of imagination in so, so many things like these by the side of the long, long trail out and along the edges of the desert. I could not accept that this look we've imposed on those faces is the best that we can do. I could not accept that that reproach, which was in those eyes, should remain there forever. If what I've told you and what you've seen in these films can help you to bring back some hope to those despairing Bushman faces, the child in me who pledged the man to the journey and the man himself will be more than content. And in that hope, I w wish you the ancient Bushman farewell. Kai Sei Kum. And I leave with you these few happy pictures of the Bushman as he still is in the central Kalahari and with your help can go on remaining indefinitely.